I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample-tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. This is Spencer with The MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by the directors of What Maisie Knew, uh, Scott McGeehee yes. and David Siegel. Yes. Um, what Maisie knew is a story of a sort of contentious custody battle, I guess you would say, between two parents from the perspective of the child, more or less, um, based on a novel by Henry James, which is one of the things I want to first start off with. Uh, I looked into it, and I'm not an English scholar, but uh, this is based on a novel from 1897. That's correct, yeah. Where was sort of the genesis of being like, that one seems like it's right for sort of a contemporary update to modern times? Because it works out very well, actually. Well, I th we think it does, too. You know, it's interesting. We, we read the script before we read the novel. So interesting. what we first encountered was a screenplay set in, you know, present-day New York, uh, you know, about this, you know, custody battle and this, you know, six-year-old girl and her perspective on all of that. Um, and it worked. And so then what surprised us then was to go back and read the you know, Henry James novel from more than 100 years earlier and yeah. see actually that it worked then too. You know, it was kind of a reverse surprise. It, I mean, it, it's, I was remarkably surprised at how it did hold up. Like, I, I would have even thought they'd be discussing things like divorce and stuff back in 1897. I, I would have thought that wouldn't even be on the table. So I, I was pretty amazed by that. I know. We kind of felt the same way. I mean, how, how much, like, we were surprised by how many of the things that had seemed modern in the script actually were rooted back then. But, you know, one of the things we heard that's interesting is Henry James apparently got the idea for writing this novel because he was at a dinner party and he heard about a custody um, you know, battle that was going on mm -hmm. and that this splitting couple had decided to share, you know, have joint custody of their kid. And he had never heard of that. That was like brand new, like the worst idea he ever like <laughs> imagined. And it was in hearing about this novel, you know, kind of problem idea, he was inspired to write this book. To write his novel. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and uh, but, you know, the context is so different now. It's like, you know, joint, joint custody is super, super common. Yeah. And, you know, everybody knows a family that's worked out that way. And, and yet, even with such different context, the, um, you know, the, the kind of human story remains really relevant. So. This is probably going to be one of the weirdest comparisons you're going to hear for this movie. But when I was watching it, the film that actually kind of popped to my mind, and this is a totally positive way, was Cloverfield. And not, not, <laughs> not because it was like a monster movie or anything like that, but that it sort of took a general concept that had been done before, you know, the monster movie, and it sort of tweaked it. And this was the thing that I liked most about it because, you know, coming as a, a child from divorce, that um, to give it from the perspective of the child, and let alone like a, a young child, really sort of added a different spin on, you know, the tra traditional divorce um, novel or story, what was it like in sort of trying to make the film from the perspective of a kid? I mean, it feels like you really have to be conscious of like, okay, could she know about this? What would this mean to her? You know, stuff like that. Well, I mean, as, as Scott said, we, we didn't write the script. So we, we worked on the script with the writers when we got involved with it. But um, the general idea of telling the story elliptically and, you know, probably three quarters of the scenes that are in the movie or, or something like that were in the script. And we tweaked that and we worked with that in terms of deciding what those vignettes, what those ellipses would, would be. But for us, the real attraction and what we got excited about was actually formally, pictorially trying to tell the story from the child's point of view, because that you don't see those very often. No. And um, that kind of creates a program around how you'll shoot it and gets you thinking about the most basic sort of, you know, building blocks of filmmaking, you know, where the camera actually is in terms of height and place, totally. who's in and out of the frame, what she hears, what she doesn't hear. And that's, you know, that's fun and exciting and challenging as well. You guys have sort of a history of working in families with dysfunction, you know, the deep end, B season. Is there something particularly... I don't know, that you can relate to or inspires you from that? Is it that it's so relatable to most people that, you know, dysfunction is something that occurs all the time, but 
um, you know, the modern family is not this happy white picket fence anymore? Or what, what is it about that that keeps drawing you guys back to these families that have these sort of complex relations? Well, David and I are brothers from different mothers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and the family dynamic is something that's a right. deep concern to us. <laughs> <laughs> Who is your father? <laughs> um, you know, something we talk a lot about is when Scott and I first started working together, we watched a lot of and got very interested in post-war American melodramas. Mm. And, you know, films, the ones that people know most are the ones by Vincent Minnelli and Douglas Sirk. But those movies um, tend to deal with family issues. They tend to deal with kind of the social mores and strictures around which people kind of both um, communicate and don't communicate with mm. each other. It's a certain kind of um, repressed emotion and desire in um, the service of sometimes, you know, higher ideals. And we are interested in that sort of thing. It's a hard thing to translate today, but I think it just formed a kind of emotional template for mm. us in terms of things that we became interested in trying to pursue ourselves. I mean, one of the things I guess is sort of a fundamental uh, question with the issue is, or the movie is, you know, they always say don't work with animals and don't work with kids. And this is fundamentally like you got to deal with the kids. So what was it wor like working with Onada Aprile? Onada Aprile, um, right. What was it like working with her and trying to, you know, get the performance from her? Because she is such a crucial linchpin to making this movie as enjoyable as it is. It was remarkably easy and super, super fun, I have to say. We, we weren't expecting that. And we, we kind of went into this you know, a little bit um, unconsideredly, I think, if that is a word. It is now. <laughs> and, 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 and with some degree of trepidation. Yeah. We'll get that in, like, the Urban Dictionary but, or something. But, I mean, you know, we, we set out to do this kind of without, I think, really thinking through as deeply as we mm. should have. How, one, how difficult it was going to be to find a six-year-old who could do it. Um, and two, how difficult it might be, you know, to make it all come together with that six-year-old. She's in every single scene in the movie, and the movie just really rests on her shoulders. Like, if, if she doesn't deliver, the movie's going to fail. And for some reason, we thought it was a good idea to s step into this, and um, we didn't know who that six-year-old was going to be when we started. Um, and we just lucked into the kind of greatest six-year-old we've ever met. I mean, she's, she's a really Phenomenal. fun, lovely yeah. girl, like great to hang out with, like really like a pleasure to have around on the set. Like everyone enjoyed, you know, being with her, look forward to coming to work to kind of see her. And she just has a real talent for, you know, David describes it, and I think it came from her mother maybe, this the, the idea of living in front of the camera. Like mm. you turn the camera on and she it, it just goes away for her and she's just able to you know be a really natural version of herself you know but in the kind of emotional you know environment that the story calls for mm. yeah was that a challenge at all because you know particularly with like julianne moore and steve coogan there's some pretty contentious moments between the two of them and you know you have this child sort of being present to all this. I mean, she's six-year-old. I don't know, like, mentally what a six-year-old is able to truly understand. Was she completely able to realize, you know, this is acting, this is not, like, something real that's going on? Was she able to understand that not, not to pay attention to swear words or anything if those are flying around? Like... Yeah, I mean, you know, she's she is six. She's not three. So it's you know, at six years old, they're pretty sentient beings. At at six years <laughs> old, so she she, you know, that those are basic ideas. You know, this is pretend. This isn't pretend. And of course, she is still very young at six. So those that that line can be blurred. But Julianne and Steve and we, you know, spoke to her a lot about the pretendingness mm. of it and the fact that it was going to it could get heightened or the peak could be heightened and the peak would come down and. And she understood that in a, in, a, in, a, in a basic but very fundamental way. And as Scott was saying, she, she really could just just live it. She could be in those scenarios, whether those scenarios were more tranquil or whether they were more peaked, and, um, and, then, and then flip it off and camera would cut and there she'd go prancing around the set, you know, playing with you know, <laughs> someone's equipment or getting into trouble doing something yeah. and having a good time. And she, she is a remarkable... Remarkable yeah, little great. human being. Was 
That the the uncertainty with her part of the reason that you guys have such a strong supporting cast. I mean, you've got like Julianne Moore, Alexander Skarsgård, Steve Coogan. All these people are very established actors. So it was like they would help guide her through this performance or was that just like serendipity? You're like, we can get Julianne Moore. Let's get Julianne Moore. Well, I mean, in this case, Julianne Moore was, she had actually read the script before mm. we had. So, so she was, you know, one of the things that attracted us actually mm. is that wow. she, she was already interested. But, you know, you always want the strongest actors you can find for any project, whether you've got a six-year-old in it or not. You know, that's, I mean, they, good actors are fun to work with and they make our work look good. Um, but in this case, it was a real consideration. Like, you know, with the adult actors, we had big conversations before we ever cast Onada about, like, the responsibility for all of us as mm -hmm. adults to kind of create the environment that was going to make it work for a six-year-old. Um, and then in the end, Onada really didn't need the kind of consideration we were all prepared to give her in mm -hmm. a way. Like, she, she you know, was in a, just a kind of member of the cast in a pretty straightforward way. She showed up prepared to do her work and um, you know, not in, in a precocious way, just in it like she understood what she needed That's to right. do that day and was there to kind of do it. She was just kind of really easy, you know, user friendly kid. One of my favorite uh, characters, I mean, they're all wonderful, but I like Steve Coogan because he's sort of going against type, you know, he's generally put in those comedic roles and I mean he does some serious stuff but it's so nice when you see those actors going against what's expected of them was that something how, how did he get involved and was that something that you thought about going into it or what was the process like in working with Steve you know he was he was the first person we thought of for the role really? I mean he Coogan, I mean uh, Beale was written as English and um, Steve was the first person that we thought of for a couple of reasons. One, because we want we did want to bring a little bit more humor to the role and have him be able to play it. Um, but also because we're just huge fans of his and, and kind of knew that he had the acting chops to do it. It's in, And we agree with you. It's nice to see comedic actors really display, display what they can do outside of that kind of environment. And Steve's great, and we had a great time with him. What was it like in terms of, you know, um, balancing the relationships in this movie because that's one of the things that you know especially for a film that's about contentious relationships in making it not so much that you know Julianne Moore becomes a complete shrew or Steve Coogan is just an asshole like there I mean there are elements to these people that you can see why they would be you know appreciated um, but it, I mean it feels like it could have very easily just turned them into complete uh, caricatures right. I mean, that goes back to what I was saying a, a moment ago, which, which is, you know, the actors bring with their bodies and their faces and their abilities to display emotion and feeling and humanity without speaking. They bring that element to um, a character that is needs to be, you know, fully rounded or complex in a way that keeps them from just seeming like a monster. And with both Steve Coogan and Julianne Moore, we knew and we felt confident that they they would do that, that they would bring that kind of roundness to their characters. And, you know, of course, we modulate that in terms of performance, we modulate in terms of edit editing, but only because they give us the breath to do that by their actual talent. Um, getting the sign to sort of start wrapping this up. So I want to ask, uh, what do you guys have coming up? I mean, you guys have done a lot of interesting projects so far, and obviously you've got to, you know, push what Maisie knew out there, but do you have anything else in the pipeline that you guys are working on that you can speak of? Or uh, is there a place that people can keep tabs on both what Maisie knew and what you guys have coming coming up, you know, websites or Twitters or anything? Um, there, there isn't really, a, and there ought to be. <laughs> um, we've got a couple of things we're working on, actually, but they're not really things we can talk about mm -hmm. yet. Sadly, they're both biopics, which is a weird thing for us. We're, we're working on two projects about people, you know, kind of re live. real life people. <laughs> That's um, awesome. Yeah, but uh, um, but, but uh, they're pretty early stages. Very cool. And so, uh, is there a, a future schedule or anything for what Maisie knew? You know, after SIF, are there other festivals that you have it lined up for at this point? I think this is the last film festival in the United States or North America that it'll it'll play in. Um, it, it's got some European stuff coming up in the, cool. in the in the summer, but it 
opens here in Seattle um, next weekend, Memorial this coming weekend, Memorial Day weekend, and starts rolling out wider at that point as well. Very cool. Uh, well, uh, David and Scott, I wish you the best of luck with the film. Thank you very I think, much. I really hope people check it out. It's a very interesting take on sort of that whole uh, conflict. And uh, check out more you. reviews at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Thank you. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's tight, don't even try to bite the side of style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.